You're listening to Elevating Early Childhood. I'm Vanessa Levin, your host, and I help teachers of preschool and pre-K teach better, save time, and live more. Joining us today on the podcast for part two of how to teach preschoolers the alphabet is our special guest, Melissa Leach. If you haven't listened to part one yet, go back and do that right now. And now on with the show. This episode is really based on questions that we receive from our listeners. And one thing that I was just talking about with another person recently was, so do we need to, when it comes to teaching the letter sounds, right? Do we need to buy like a really fancy, super scripted type of curricula in order to teach the letter sounds to our kids? Like, because you know, back in the day, it was you teach how to identify and name the letters. Then we teach the letter sounds. Now we start reading magically somehow. I'm not saying that's the way it really is, but right. that's kind of like the old school way of thinking. So, so what about letter sounds? Yeah. Um, so there definitely is a big push for what we, what we refer to as explicit instruction, right? So there does need to be explicit instruction with letters letter sounds. Um, You know, but at the same time, I think we need to examine, I say it often, if if anyone listening has ever heard me talk before, um, I talk about, you know, examining your lane, right? Like everybody has their lane in education. And so, um, you know, when I think of the early childhood lane, the threes and the fours, I consider this more of the exploratory rather than the explicit, Right. So this exploratory place with letters and letter sounds, I think that kids are going to be learning about letters and letter sounds in um, three year old and four year old classrooms in more of a differentiated way. So less of the letter of the week approach and more of the letters all the time approach. And which one do you need today? Um, You know, three and four year olds need to be over there in that pretend play area, writing something down on a note or in the construction area, writing. So we can't, I mean, maybe we aren't in the 10th week of school, so they haven't learned a certain letter yet, but if they're over there in pretend play, uh, exploratory, playful use of um, letters and again, sounds. So the answer is, in my opinion, in a three and four-year-old classroom, It's not so much about the explicit phonics program, right? Because that's the other thing too, Vanessa, is there's phonics, which is really a kindergarten, five-year-old state of Texas, at least, um, you know, explicit instruction. So phonics program starting kindergarten, but before phonics, there's so much that's happening for young children by way of more of a foundational language um, precursor to phonics that we call phonological awareness and then phonemic awareness. And so I'm hopeful that we'll have time today to Vanessa to talk a little bit more about kind of what that is, because learning letters and letter sounds is phonics, right? That's phonics. And again, we it's going to happen. Um, But it's not going to be a systematic, you know, from this week to this week, everybody's instruction in three and four year old classrooms. However, phonological awareness. So you tell me when it's time, Vanessa, but I'll, I'll, (laughs) I'll wait for you to give me the go on talking about that. No, I think we should go ahead um, because it's, I think, probably one of the most overlooked areas of emergent literacy in the early childhood classroom, not overlooked because we're negligent, but overlooked because I don't know why. I just feel like it's, it's a little bit underrepresented, you know? Yes. Overlooked, um, underestimated. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, and one of the things, um, that you, that you say, you know, like we, I don't know why is because phonological awareness doesn't have anything that can come home in the backpack. True. Yeah, that's probably phonological awareness, right? Nothing comes home in the backpack with what the teacher and the students did for phonological awareness. Right. Um, it, it just, it's, it's so let's define, okay. What is phonological awareness? So phonological awareness is auditory. Okay. Mm-hmm. It is a listening skill. 
Um, it is. And so, well, and let's start there. We got kids that just need to work on their listening skills before <laughs> right. they can, right? So, so phonological awareness is listening to the sounds of, in our case, the English language. Mm-hmm. So every language, um, you know, it produces different sounds. We call these phonemes. Okay. So we have letters that represent these phonemes, which is what allows us to read. So the word, let's take the word cat, right? Cat. I can read cat because I know what these letters are and I know the phonemes, the sounds that these letters represent. So in cat, there are three phonemes, k, a, and t. Those are three individual sounds, three individual phonemes, right? Now, if I took um, the, I'm going to try to come up with this on the fly. Um, If I took, give me like um, the CH, right? CH is two letters, but it makes one sound. Okay. So phonemes is the one individual sound. And we, as early childhood teachers, should be playing with this with kids. So the um, phonological awareness is really like a continuum. And I know many of us have probably done phonological awareness things in our classroom. If you've done rhyming with kids, right. not the rhyming worksheet, not something they have to cut and paste and glue down. No. If you have just said hat, cat, and the kids say bat, or if you say, I'm going to say three words and you tell me which one, you know, doesn't rhyme. Right. There's there's a whole continuum just within rhyming, producing it, um, hearing it, being able to substitute. Um, So if you've done rhyme in your classroom, you're doing phonological awareness. If you focused on it's harder, but if you focused on alliteration. Right. Um, So right now, Jack has rhymes mastered. And again, it's playful. So three year olds and four year olds love to play. He thinks it's hilarious. He's he's always rhyming um, or or he just, he thinks it's so fun. And so now I'm trying to get him to do alliteration. So, you know, it's that I'm going on a picnic and I'm putting, um, you know, um, bubble gum in my, in my basket. And now kids have to all think of things that start with a b sound, bubble gum, banana. Some kids says, this is hard work, but I'm not talking about the letter B. I did not say we have to pack things that start with B. I'm saying we have to start things that sound like this. Blueberries, right? I, that's what I'm doing. Right. Um, if you've done alliteration, you're doing phonological awareness. If you've done rhyming, you're doing phonological awareness. And it's got to be more than just like that one day, like that one Tuesday when we did that rhyming thing. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's really got to just be something that we're, we're doing consciously right. and knowing, you know, why we're doing it, um, but we're doing it consciously and um, we're doing it in all the nooks and crannies of our day. If you've done anything with syllables, right? So again, you, you don't start with syllables in the first week of, with three-year-olds if there's a continuum. Right. So oftentimes we start with rhyming, alliteration, syllables, um, but the real goal of phonological awareness is getting kids to a place, and this is typically a four-year-old, um, five-year-old. We actually work on it through second grade with some of our kiddos, um, but it's, it's being able to manipulate at the individual phoneme le- level. Right. So let's go back to that cat. Right. Cat. Cat. So I could be saying something. That's phonological awareness. If I said, "Okay, Vanessa, I'm going to say a word." Um, What did I hear a teacher call it the other day? She was like, "I'm going to say it in my robot voice, and I want you to say it in the regular voice." Right. So she said, "Cat," and the kids went, "Cat." Right. Um, I was in another classroom the other day, and they were doing phonological awareness. It was a, I believe, a kindergarten classroom. And she gave like a umbrella, like a, um, what do you call that? Like a theme, or if you will. She said, the theme is transportation. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say a word silly, and you have to tell me the right word. So now we're looking at the, the beginning sound. So she said a um, bicycle. <laughs> and they went, a what? And she said, a bicycle. And they said, no, bicycle. And she said, oh, okay. She said, a dar. And they said, a dar? And she said, oh, and then, they, oh no, a car. 
Right. So again, all just listening. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's really scary, but this is a, it's a screener that we do. We yeah. screen kids for their at risk. We screen them. And if they can't do these things, they're considered at risk for their ability to decode and read later. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a big push back in Texas um, in the standards. You know, not all kids go to any kind of school before kindergarten um, in Texas. Uh, kindergarten isn't even required. So some kids don't, most kids go, but not all kids have to. Right. But in the Texas standards, they've put nursery rhymes back in. Oh, good. Nursery rhymes are listed as a genre in the kindergarten standards. So yeah. yay. So let's think about, you know, there's a reason why nursery rhymes um, right. haven't, haven't left us or shouldn't have left us. Right. Um, the research says, that you can predict how well a child will read in third grade based on the number of nursery rhymes they can recite upon entering kindergarten. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's so important. And, you know, not to keep talking about my nephew or anything, but going back to my sneaky informal assessment that I was doing when he was here, I also read him some rhyming books. I tried to read one a night at bedtime in another book that he picked, I picked one, he picked one. And I was reading like, I think it's called if um, taking a trip on a train, it's, it's that to the cadence of the house that Jack built. Right. And Uh so uh there was always rhyming in there at the, on the last sentence. And so I would let him fill it in and he did great. So every night I was assessing his rhyming ability by reading these rhyming stories. So what I'm hearing you saying is that because all of this is basically auditory, because all of these phonological mm-hmm. awareness skills and phonemes are, are auditory, there's not a lot of tangible things that we actually need to teach them. Because that's also another question I get a lot. What should I buy to teach my kids these skills? And really, there's you don't have to buy <laughs> oh, you don't anything, right? You don't. Um, no, please, no, don't stop. Um, but, like, I'd rather you get a Starbucks, okay? Um, no, you don't. You don't have to buy anything for this. Um, it is, it's all, and, and here's the other thing too. <laughs> like, don't laugh at me, but phonological awareness also doesn't have to be changed out with the seasons. Right. Right. So it's not like I have to buy something with apples on it to do phonological awareness. And then I need to buy something with pumpkins on it to do the phonological awareness. Like it doesn't change with seasons. Um, It's about our songs. Um, It's about just saying, okay, am I reading and are we singing, you know, um, nursery rhymes? Am I, am I using them? Because everything phonological awareness related can be done in nursery rhymes. They are word play. I want you to think too about like um, Dr. Seuss books. Their word play. That's right. his. All those books are based on just making up words that rhyme and are silly. You could go and dissect those books, you know, and do that work. Um, there is. So again, I don't. I, I did before, you know, this just kind of do a little teachers pay teachers um, search for phonological awareness. Um, and remember, we said that it can't be done on a worksheet. Right. But I'll tell you what. There are a lot of worksheets you could buy and I'm, you know, and just why, right? Like if we're cutting and pasting, we've moved out of our phonological awareness, you know, lane and our work. Um, So there's lots of things that are sold as phonological awareness on teachers pay teachers. But again, you don't have to buy anything. It is sometimes nice though, to have like a resource that just And maybe, Vanessa, you have these resources and these games and these things. Um, It is kind of sometimes nice to just, you know, like I was looking out the window trying to make up words. Okay, when you've got 20 kids in front of you, good luck with that. You cannot just make up words and you can't. So sometimes it is nice just to have the bank of words already provided for you. Or, you know, there's only so many times you can sing Willoughby Wallaby Woo and you're just give me something else. Right. So it's nice to sort of have some kind of a resource that, you know, is in line, you know, with, with what phonological awareness is. So, you know, it's nothing flashy, so it's not cute. 
Okay. It's not in color. Um, it, you don't have to print anything and it's not the jazziest, um, but it is a um, tried and true resource. It's on Amazon. I Googled, I think it's $23 total, but it is the only thing that you would need. Um, and it's called Phonemic Awareness in Young Children. It's by Marilyn J. Adams. Yeah, I have that one. It is a little spiral bound book. It, it's Wonderful. So it actually takes you um, through the continuum. So I'm just reading from the table of contents here. It has um, a whole set. It looks like about 10 um, of just listening games. Just like I'm going to make a sound like back, like think back. I remember when I was in early childhood, my teacher would, we had like this, it was like listening bingo or something crazy. And like, you'd hear like a train whistle and you'd listen, you'd be like a train whistle or a dog barking or wait, what is that noise? Just those kinds of things. So there's listening games because if they can't listen, don't start with the rest of it. So you just kind of some listening games. It's got some rhyming play that's going on. Um, It moves into talking about words and sentences into syllables, um, into initial and final sounds, and then to the work at the phoneme um, level. And so it explains the game, if you will, and then it gives you the specific words that you could use um, to play that game. You know, and like I said, we don't have to change these out. You can, I mean, you could go all, it's transportation and I'm going to come up with transportation words this week and use them with this game that we've played before. Absolutely. But you don't have to buy anything to do that. Right. Right. Like, so I just think that this, this resource, $23. Yes. You're going to have to skip some Starbucks possibly, but Mm -hmm. I hands down know that phonemic awareness in young children is a Beautiful resource. Yeah, that's the gold standard, really. I had that one. Our district bought it for all the teachers back in the 90s, whenever, way back when. And it is 1997 was its copyright. So it might have been as early as 97 for you. Yep, yep. And um, it was, it's phenomenal. It has, you know, it, it basically reinforces everything that you and I are talking about. We're not just making this stuff up. Like this is, this is real. This is real. I'm not that smart. Yeah, you I can't know. make anything up. That's why I like to have guests on the podcast, though, because sometimes I have kooky ideas and people are just like, well, that's just another one of Vanessa's kooky ideas. But it's not. This has actually been researched in its 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 best practice. And I guess going back to what you asked me about what are my ideas, I would I would just like to stress that you don't need anything to do your job as far as teaching phonological awareness. And that includes all of the different components on the phonological uh, awareness spectrum. If you've got books that you read aloud to your kids, if you've got songs that you sing, if you do finger plays with your kids and nursery rhymes, that right there is your teacher toolbox for a recipe for phonological awareness success. I mean, if you wanted to buy something, like Melissa just said, you could do that. Another thing that I would probably recommend are picture cards, just because it's hard to teach a kid to rhyme with cat. If, if, especially like in my case, working with second language learners, they kind of need to know what a cat is. And so I always like to use picture cards and I like to use the same picture cards over and over just because that we're building that background knowledge and kind of front loading the picture cards first so that we're all on the same page that this indeed is a cat (laughs) or this indeed is whatever the thing is. And then having those cards and then just using them in different ways. um, Mm -hmm. That's like your entire toolbox right there. Um, I know sometimes we want physical things in the box, the imaginary toolbox, (laughs) because it makes us feel more equipped or it's, you know, some, because somebody has said, I need to see mm-hmm. what materials you're using, mm-hmm. or I'm going to give you some materials. And so if I had a budget, I would buy those Lakeshore letter and letter sound tubs. I think those mm-hmm. are the coolest thing on the planet. They um, are. They're- I've seen some teachers trying to, you know, create them themselves. Um, when I was in the classroom, I would send kids home. Um, we called it our letter box. And so they would go home, um, you know, with the letter, um, they would have to go around their house and find some things that started with that letter. And I asked families if they're willing to let me keep the items. And then we created our own little letter bags, um, from, you know, from that. But the other thing that was just coming to mind when you were talking, um, about, you know, if I had to buy something, um, 
the other thing that I think that teachers need to, and I don't even want to say in, invest in it monetarily. It's not really a big investment monetarily, but it's an investment um, ped, in, in terms of pedagogy, right? Mm-hmm. I think that teachers need to invest in what we refer to um, as an ABC linking chart. Um, Again, some of you that know me, I, I'm like a parent. I, I'm always talking about the same thing. And it, it is. I talk often about an ABC linking chart. So, you know, in your classroom, you have one place where you are representing for kids that that one thing that when I think about this letter and you know, there's a, a, a sim, uh, it's a symbol. The letter itself is a symbol, but there's then something concrete that I can connect that letter to. So for example, in many classrooms, it's a, um, and an apple. Mm -hmm. So every time I think of that letter, or if I'm just saying, ah, ah, kids will say, ah, apple. And they might not even know that that's an A yet, but they know they need the letter Right. That represents that sound like the a ah in apple or the j, you know, like whatever, right? So again, you every and every teacher, it's not a big investment, but I, I just would think I'm gonna get this one link to letters. It's gonna be, you know, on my wall. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be in other places in my classroom. Um, it's gonna be in my group area. It's going to be at my students' desks or at their tables or inside their writing folder, or I'm going to have it on the fridge in the pretend play. I'm going to have it over in the block area because I don't know why they might eat it. Who knows? I'm going to have that one link to letters. So again, when we talk about kind of the investment, I would also encourage you to find one that's easily reproducible. So I'm not talking about you buying something from Lakeshore that's $14.99 and you have to buy 10 of them. Right. If you went and Googled ABC linking chart, I know Vanessa has one mm-hmm. and there are, there are several, but the idea is that when I'm talking about the B, it's balloon. And in my class, it's always balloon or maybe it's bear. I don't know, but it's really confusing for a three-year-old or a four-year-old. If it's balloon over there on that wall right. and it's bear over there on that wall, I'm not going to have that one yeah. link, right? Yeah. Yeah, we'll put the link to my linking chart in the show notes here for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And if you're a listener, just um, go to the prekpages.com slash listen, and it'll take you to, you know, so you can get all the links and good stuff. Another thing that you said reminded me of something that definitely does not break the bank, but I would put in my teacher toolbox for this. And that is a dollar store, not a fancy electronic, but a dollar store plastic microphone. I used those stinking things all day, every day in my classroom to teach all the phonological awareness skills. Not that the the microphone teaches anything, but it's enticing and fun to hold a microphone and say rhyming words or, you know, whatever the skill is that you're doing to hold the microphone and, and do that. It was so motivating for my kids. I couldn't go anywhere without my plastic microphone. <laughs> okay. So I, I love that. And I'm even envisioning like a small group set of microphones, um, yeah. you know, like w- handing my microphone to some kids to be able to practice, um, you know, having a small group set, like that's so motivating. And there's, again, it's not, it, it, it is about being fun and kids, you know, it, being engaged, but there's also research to back that up. So you know why we've used phonics phones in years past, right? Um, It amplifies the sound. So too do those cool dollar store microphones. They amplify the sound. Um, We're encouraged to have kids really listening to themselves make sounds. That just helps really have them hearing it. And then we're also encouraged to have kids paying attention to how their mouth is forming that sound. Where is their tongue When you, where's your tongue when you say that sound? Where are your lips? What are your lips doing right now? Look at your friend's lips. Look at your lips, right? Is your mouth open? Let's say that together. Ah, ah. Oh, gosh. (laughs) You can see all, okay. If you're listening, you can't see what my, what that just looked like. But if you're watching, (laughs) you just saw all of my dental work. So here we go. Like, ah, um, you know, is your mouth open? Is it closed? Where's your tongue? Where are your lips? Um, Really helping kids kind of focus on that's all part of it. It doesn't seem like it, but all of that is part of, can they decode this multisyllabic word as a third grader? It's we're getting there. I brought like, we're getting there. And sometimes that's why it's overlooked is because it doesn't feel like you're doing anything. (laughs) 
why are we doing all of this? This didn't help them learn their letters. Well, oh. it's the before you learn the letters stuff. Right. Well, I think you've given us a really, I think you've made a lot of our listeners feel really good about what they have been doing in the classroom while also giving us food for thought about things we can do or maybe haven't tried yet. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, maybe someone hasn't been doing nursery rhymes because they thought maybe they were old fashioned. I get, I get that a lot. Or maybe um, they just didn't even realize that they right. were so super powerful. So we've got, a, I think, a lot of information to share with our listeners now. We've talked about um, identifying and naming letters of the alphabet. We've talked about... Um, phonological awareness and phonemes. And we talked about ways to teach these, these skills without breaking the bank or, you know, going out and buying a super expensive scripted program. And I think my closing thought, I'm going to get, let you have your closing thoughts, Melissa, but my closing thought is that you don't need a fancy scripted curriculum to teach these skills. If you follow the way that children learn and use the best practices and the research-based ideas that are out there, research that's been done, you've got everything you need. The reason these scripted programs exist, and there's nothing wrong with them, but the reason they exist is because they are making sure that all the bases are covered for your school or your school district. Mm -hmm. So for schools that are constantly having issues with, you know, maybe low reading scores or just low test scores in general, these programs are bought as a stopgap measure in a lot of cases. And so it's basically kind of like punishing everybody for them, you know what I mean, for something that is sometimes out of our control. And um, so I, I just don't want people to feel like they have to do that in order to, um, to help their kids learn these skills. Now, if you have one, that's great. Use it and then use all the ideas we just talked about to spice it up and make it better, to make it more fun, more developmentally appropriate, more engaging for your kids, right? What do you think, Mm -hmm. Melissa? Yep, Um, absolutely. And again, you know, I am very passionate, um, you know, about early childhood education and about early childhood teachers. And programs are gonna find their way to our students. like. Mm -hmm. They're going to find, they're going to find them. Okay. And so when I think about the work that we can do in a three-year-old classroom and a four-year-old classroom, that's the, before the programs find our kids work (laughs) and it's, it's the play. And again, worksheets are going to find their way to our kids in their educational career. And I just think, what can we do instead for our three-year-olds and four-year-olds? Yeah. That's a great, a great way to look at it. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today and listening to us here at Elevating Early Childhood. And I also want to thank you, Melissa Leach, for joining us here today as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. This was an honor. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin. This is Melissa Leach. Bye.